tell you uh, just a little bit about uh, what we have called the restraining rights. Um, so um, the well, I, I was I spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to structure this presentation and uh, whether to include consent withdrawal or not. Uh, why is it so? Because the withdrawal of consent is technically not a right of a data subject. It is not um, included in the GDPR under the chapter uh, data subject rights. Uh, it is also not, this right is also not exercised like other rights. So there is no request for consent withdrawal and there is no procedure to follow. Uh, consent can simply be withdrawn at any time. And this is, um, this results from the very definition of consent uh, in the GDPR. Uh, so it's article seven of the GDPR. Uh, you will see that the rights of data subjects are basically articles 12 to uh, 22. Uh, and withdrawal of consent is uh, in the previous chapter. Uh, it's in Article 7. But uh, I think that conceptually is not very different from certain rights of data subjects. So I decided to include it in this presentation uh, at the very beginning uh, because it has uh, this, uh, this is very fundamental, not, not even to the rights of data subject, but to the very uh, nature of the GDPR. Um, now, uh, you know that uh, in order to process personal data, you need a legal basis. Processing has to be lawful, which means it needs a legal basis. Um, one of those legal bases is consent. It is not the only legal basis. Uh, other legal bases are available, especially legitimate interests or public interest can be used in the context of research. But very often, especially in uh, certain countries that I'm familiar with, uh, the processing uh, of personal data for research purposes is based on consent. So whenever your processing is based on consent, uh, you need to be aware of the fact that this consent can be withdrawn at any time. Um, and withdrawing consent should be as easy as giving it. So if consent was given by a single mouse click, by accepting uh, the privacy policy, for example, um, then it, there should be a possibility to withdraw it with a single click. Um, providing the possibility to withdraw consent under some strange conditions or in some weird context that is completely unrelated to uh, the circumstances in which the consent was collected is not uh, an appropriate mechanism for withdrawal. So for instance, if you collected uh, consent via simple signature uh, on, on a form or simply accepting a consent form online with you know, taking a box and clicking okay, double click, uh, and then you inform data subjects that if they want to withdraw consent, they need to call this number between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. on a Thursday. And then perhaps there will be someone uh, who will take care of uh, this request. This is not the proper way of handling uh, consent withdrawal. And if the mechanism for withdrawing consent is not appropriate, it means the whole consent is invalid. So um, proper uh, mechanism for withdrawal is a condition of validity uh, for your consent. So if your processing is based on consent, it is extremely, extremely important to take care of this. What are the consequences of withdrawal of consent? So, well, first of all, um, withdrawal is not retroactive which means that the processing that took place before the withdrawal remains lawful, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to undo, unbake the cake, undo what you've done. Uh, it means that you should stop the processing and delete the data according to the ADPB guidelines. 
Um, or if you don't, the data subject can request uh, erasure. I will tell you more in, about erasure in a couple of minutes. Unless a different legal basis is available for the processing. Uh, so uh, let's say initially well, your processing was based on consent. And then you decide that actually there are other grounds available. I also have legitimate interest in the processing. So I can continue the processing on the basis of legitimate interest uh, or on the basis of public interest. However, um, remember about transparency and the right to be informed. Uh, the data subjects have to be informed um, about the purposes and the legal basis of the processing up front. Uh, so you need to be transparent uh, about your new legal basis as well. So we have to inform data subjects about it. Uh, and uh, good practice is to, uh, when you collect consent, uh, already inform the data subjects that they have a possibility to withdraw consent, but if they withdraw consent, processing for some purposes, like research purposes, will continue on the ground of legitimate interest or public interest. Uh, so withdrawal of consent can hurt you, can hurt your resources real bad if you have no other legal basis uh, available. And of course, the availability of the legal basis will depend on uh, the specific circumstances of your case. Um, the right to object is Article 21 of the GDPR, and it's, um, it can be thought of as uh, an equivalent of, of a consent withdrawal when processing is based on legitimate interest. So processing is uh, without consent. The, the legal basis for the processing is legitimate interest. The data subject can object to the processing on the grounds relating to his or her particular situation at any time. Now, what it means on the grounds relating to his or her particular situation, uh, arguably, it means for any reason, including no reason at all. Uh, actually, no, uh, no reason at all is not a good ground. Uh, he has to provide a reason, uh, but um, it can be a reason that relates to his particular situation. So for instance, the mere fact that my data is present in this resource causes me reputational harm, for example, because I don't support uh, the purpose for, we, for which the research was made, or I don't endorse the organization who uh, compiled the resource. That's, of course, very subjective, but uh, still uh, arguably a valid ground for, for objection. Now, how the data controller can respond to that? Well, he can respond by providing um, an overriding legitimate interest. There is one exception if the processing is carried out for direct marketing purposes, which is not the case of language research uh, normally, uh, then um, this is an absolute right. So the data subject can object anytime for whatever reason, and there is no uh, possibility to respond differently than by accepting his request. So there is no possibility to argue against this request by, by providing an overriding legitimate interest. Uh, now, what is an overriding legitimate interest? Uh, well, of course, uh, it's, it's a matter of opinion largely, but uh, remember that as a controller, uh, you are uh, under the, the accountability principle, you are responsible for demonstrating compliance with the GDPR, which means uh, that um, you have to document your analysis that led you to the conclusion that your interest is overriding uh, the objection and, well, basically you have to be ready to defend yourself. Uh, so um, this is a decision that should be well thought over. If the processing is carried out for research purposes and uh, on the basis of legitimate interest and um, the data subject objects, exercises his right to, uh, to object. Uh, 
Well, uh, what happens is that uh, the researcher can invoke public interest. Uh, his public interest is a valid defense uh, when it comes to, or is a valid defense against uh, the right to object when it comes to research uh, purposes. And this right can be further limited by national law. For example, in Germany, it is limited under the Federal uh, Data Protection Act, the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. Um, uh, when I say that a right can be limited by national law, it doesn't mean that national law uh, can uh, completely take this right away from data subjects. Uh, rather, it can say that this right can be limited when the exercise of this right could uh, seriously impair the objectives of the research or make uh, the research impossible. These are the conditions actually for, for limiting uh, rights of data subject under national law. What are the consequences of such an objection? Well, if the objection is successful, uh, if you cannot, if you don't have a valid defense, a valid overriding legitimate interest, or uh, or you cannot argue that your research is carried out in public interest, then the processing should stop. And the data subject may request erasure or restriction uh, of the data. And I will tell you right now what is erasure. Um, you must have heard about the right to be forgotten, the so-called right uh, of, of erasure. Well, actually the, the real name is right of erasure and it's uh, uh, commonly referred to for uh, journalistic purposes, so to say, as the right to be forgotten. Although the name appears in the GDPR as well, right to be forgotten. Um, this is uh, the most feared right by researchers, the most feared right of data subjects, uh, because it eventually leads to, it may lead to the deletion, to the obligation to delete uh, the data altogether. Uh, however, it is important to keep in mind that this right is only available in some very limited situations. So for instance, if consent is withdrawn and there is no other basis available, this is something that I covered on my previous slide. Uh, if there is a, there has been a successful objection to the processing, that's my uh, previous slide. Uh, if the processing is unlawful, so there is no legal basis whatsoever, make sure not to process data without legal basis, always have a legal basis for the processing or else uh, you will face uh, uh, an ex a request for erasure that you will have no valid defense against. Uh, just for your information, uh, uh, request for erasure is almost always successful when it concerns data posted on social media by a child. Now, the request can be made by an adult if he posted, he or she posted the personal, the, the data on social media as a child. Uh, that's an uh, interesting piece of information, but not directly relevant to language resources, unless you process language data collected by, from social media, and this includes uh, data posted by children. Uh, when processing is carried out for research purposes, the right of erasure does not apply, but only if its exercise could render impossible or seriously impair the objectives of the processing, that is the research objectives. Uh, I think the standard is uh, quite, should be quite high and should not be regarded as automatically met in the context of language research. Let's say you have a large corpus and you have a request for erasure. Someone says, can you please uh, erase my data from your corpus? Uh, would it really render impossible your research or would it really seriously impair your research? Well, of course, it depends on the circumstances of the specific case, but I believe that the standard is actually quite high. It would be difficult to argue that deleting uh, 1,000 words out of a very large corpus of uh, language, uh, of a language would seriously impair the, the, uh, the objectives of, of the research. 
The consequences of the right to erasure uh, is that the data has to be deleted. And when I say deleted, I mean really deleted. And this includes not just migrated to a different section of your database, to a different database, but really deleted, including all the backup copies. Um, all right. Um, and the final right is the right to restrict that the restriction of processing, the right to restrict processing is also referred to as blocking. Uh, this is a right that, uh, honestly, I have not come across uh, in practice. Uh, I believe because data subjects are not very aware of it, and sometimes they request, they object, or they request erasure, whereas they really mean restriction, uh, but something that is quite rare in practice. It can be thought of as an alternative to the right of erasure under certain conditions that are fairly similar to the conditions for uh, erasure. Um, a data subject can request restriction or blocking of his data, and these data are not deleted. Uh, they are still stored by the controller, but they can be processed only with consent of the data subject. Now, why would someone do this? Uh, because they may consider uh, that they, uh, they may want to prepare a legal claim, for example. They may want to sue the controller, so they don't want the data to be deleted, uh, because then they would have a hard time constituting a proof against uh, the controller to substantiate their claim. Uh, but at the same time, they, want, they don't want the data to be uh, visible for example, or, or uh, uh, available to, to, to the public. Right, so this is uh, the context in which restriction uh, is used. It's usually temporary by its very nature because the data never remain restricted forever. It, it finishes either by lifting restriction by the controller uh, when the, 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 the request is ill-founded or by uh, deletion of the data, erasure of the data. If processing is carried out for research purposes, uh, the right can be limited by national law, and it is limited, for example, in Germany under the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. And I think an idea for you to consider that it's a good practice to restrict the processing of personal data whenever you receive uh, a request concerning erasure, rectification, or, or objection. Um, so, uh, well, of course, it takes time to consider a request, to consider the merits of a request. Uh, the deadline is normally up to one month. Uh, so, someone wants his data erased, uh, he requests erasure, and will you really make him wait for one month? Uh, well, Formally you can, but in certain circumstances, it might be good practice to restrict the data, move it to a, a parallel processing system when it cannot be accessed uh, and can only be further processed with consent of the data subject. And that way uh, you, you put the data on hold, so to say, for the time of examining, uh, for the time of the examination of, of the request. Good practice, not, requ not required by the GDPR, but uh, good practice nevertheless, in my opinion. Not always, not always uh, doable or not always uh, uh, really uh, desirable, but uh, something to consider. Now, what if you already shared the data that, and then you receive an, a request for erasure, but the data are already in possession of of other people as well. You're obliged to communicate any request for rectification, erasure, or restriction to all the recipients, that is to anyone with whom uh, you have shared the data, unless this is impossible or involves disproportionate effort. Again, it's up to you to prove the impossibility or the, the, the disproportionate effort. Uh, do you have to inform the data subject uh, 
about all the recipients uh, of his or her data, yes, upon request, so that he can then uh, decide if he wants to request erasure from these data subjects uh, as well. If erasure is requested for uh, data that have been made public online, uh, you are obliged as the processor to take reasonable steps um, to inform anyone who processes the data uh, to erase any copies or links. And this uh, chiefly includes uh, Google. So uh, yeah, Google will store a link to, uh, to the material that was put online and it's, you should take reasonable steps including technical measures to prevent anyone from sharing uh, links or, or copies of the data. Well, of course, it is unlikely to be fully successful, but you have to document that you have taken reasonable steps. Right, uh, a brief conclusion uh, is that the restraining rights of data subjects are indeed very limited when it comes to research. You may, however, receive second-hand requests, what I refer to as second-hand requests, are requests that don't come from the data subject directly, but they come from, for example, publishers. And I work at an institution that has a very large corpus of newspaper articles. And very regularly, you, will be, you would be astonished to know how regularly, how often uh, we receive requests for erasure from uh, the publishers. If someone requested erasure from the publisher and the publisher uh, erased the data and then as he's obliged to do, uh, he informed us about the request. Well, of course, then we should consider the request on our own, on its own merits. Uh, say perhaps that, well, we are processing data for research purposes, so the right of erasure doesn't really apply to us because it could seriously impair uh, our objectives. Uh, but instead, uh, we just delete the data. Um, why we do so? Because we believe that um, even if there is no legal obligation to do so, even if legal co in, in research context, it is good practice uh, to examine the merits of each request and if it's a justifiable request and it doesn't harm the research objectives that much, it, it just should be uh, acted upon uh, the request. So such extended approach to uh, data subject rights can also, in my view, constitute a safeguard for the right, rights and freedoms of data subjects. As you know, uh, research under the GDPR in order to qualify for exceptions should be accompanied with uh, appropriate safeguards. Now, these safeguards can be varied, pseudonymization uh, um, or um, um, training of the personnel who handles personal da data. Uh, but this extended approach to data rights where data, where, uh, data subject rights are considered on their own merits independently from the legal obligation uh, can also be uh, a safeguard, in my opinion. Um, one last thing is that the erasure of data from corpora is often a technical problem because it uh, leads to the necessity of releasing a new version uh, of, of a resource. So there is this versioning issue. And I'm not a technician, but uh, my learned colleagues have uh, written a very interesting article about uh, long-term archiving of large corpora that addresses the issue of versioning and erasing data from corpora. And I provided, I have provided a link to this article and I do invite you to read it. Uh, there is also a short legal section uh, written by yours truly, so I can only recommend it. Um, thank you very much for your attention.